Today we are talking about some reef keeping misconceptions. Now a couple of these aren't really misconceptions, but rather they are topics or sayings that can be misconstrued. And one of these may even sound like a rant. But without further ado, let's get started. Number one, shipping is cheap. For those who get turned away by shipping charges, shipping corals is very expensive. Not only is water heavy, but overnight with morning delivery accounts for the largest cost. Just to give you a rough idea of how much I pay, to ship across the US is about $50 to $70 for an average box size and weight. This is not counting the cost of the shipping cooler. There are coral vendors that offer seemingly cheap shipping, but you can bet that they price the cost of shipping into the coral price. So in that situation, you are actually paying more for shipping the more corals that you buy. Number two, you need expensive corals to have a nice tank. I'm not talking about the collectors who are just after rare pieces, Rather, this is directed to those who want to create their own little masterpiece. Having subtle pinks on a few coralites isn't going to make a nice tank. It's hard to see those subtle colors three feet away, and for a lot of them, you need to be looking top down to really appreciate these subtle colors of these so-called high-end pieces anyway. They make aquarium magnifying glasses now for God's sake. Having a nice tank more has to do with combining artistic principles and good husbandry. You need healthy bright colored colonies and when you place complementary colors next to each other, in other words colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel, you can really amplify the color pop of your tank. Other essentials of art such as aquascape or composition, using the rule of thirds and creating depth is what's going to make a masterpiece. I don't claim to be an artist, but I have seen some mediocre looking tanks with expensive corals and conversely jaw dropping tanks with mainly inexpensive pieces. Number 3. Coral price is proportional to value. This is standard psychological marketing that the reefing hobby takes full advantage of. The point of this topic is to encourage buyers to stop and ask yourself is what you are buying worth it? Because it's easy to get caught up in the social media hype. For example, I often see way overpriced frags for sale, but yet people still buy them. Maybe people just have money to blow which is good for them, but what I think compounds the situation is social media hype. When you see people commenting with fire emojis and you see that some people are actually buying them, what happens is that other people feel compelled to buy it too. Maybe they want to be part of the exclusive group of people who have this rare coral or maybe they are hoping that they can propagate it and sell it later for profit. I don't know, but it's almost too easy for sellers when they list a coral with a high price, they couple it with an unbelievable picture, and then they have social media hype men posting fire emojis. It's a done deal. People are going to buy it which essentially enables sellers to keep jacking up prices. I'm not the only one who thinks coral prices have been out of this world and I would say a large part of why it's accelerating is because of social media hype. I know people want nice things but buying corals is not like buying cars or smartphones where you can objectively say one is better than the other. Sure, some pieces justify a higher price and what's a fair price and what's not is really a gray area. But my message is mainly for those who are new to this game. Don't automatically assume that a coral's price necessarily equates to value. And to go along with the previous point, you don't need expensive corals to make a nice tank anyway. Number 4. A picture of a frag tells you what you are buying. Frags do weird things. Sometimes they develop colors that aren't dominant or even present when the frag grows. You really need to see a full size colony pick to determine the worth of a frag. Frags can be deceiving since they are the most colorful part of the colony. But hey, don't take my word for it. This is Vincent Chalius who is one of the pioneers of coral farming, speaking at Reefstock 2018. What I like about frags is that actually this is the most colorful part of the coral. Why is that? Because those antlers are brown and they are lacking in the tips. The coral is growing, the grand lab didn't get enough time to go up the branch. The tips are the most exposed to UV light, so that's why they produce a lot of more pigments. So the tips produce the pigment before being colonized by the zoanthella. The calcification uses up all the energy and produces a lot of toxic waste. That's why the zoanthella cannot go up the tips. So quarter inch frags is actually more colorful than a fully grown colony. You know? So every time you buy a frag, you actually buy the most colorful part of the coral. That's why it's a good business. <laughs> <laughs> Number 5. Dipping is 100% reliable in killing parasites. 
Flatworms and nudibranchs and their eggs can make it through a dip regardless of what a dip claims. It's best to have a quarantine tank, but I know it's not practical for everyone. There are steps, however, that you can take and when done together, may decrease your chance of getting a parasite. For example, 1. Only buy from people who take quarantine super seriously. 2. Cut off the plug and leave some healthy tissue behind, especially if it's a stick like coral. 3. Is dip. It does help. 4. Is inspect. I use this inexpensive jeweler's eye loop I got off of Amazon. And lastly, if you don't have a quarantine tank, you really have to hope or pray that you don't get anything. Number 6. You will save money if you buy cheap equipment. For this one I'm mainly referring to Acropora keepers because really it's not difficult keeping LPS and softies. The problem with going cheap is that it's going to cost you more when you end up replacing it. Trust me I learned that from experience many times. The bad thing about the internet is this, if you want something to be true, just google it. You're likely to find at least one example that justifies buying that piece of crap equipment. It's called confirmation bias. Look. Just make sure you do your research to see what most people are successful with and you're not basing your decision on finding the few rare instances of where it works. Having a nice tank definitely does not need the most expensive equipment, but on the other hand, if you're doing the bare minimums to get by, you are setting yourself up for failure. Number 7. Drawing skimmer air from the outside will significantly improve pH. It may help a tiny bit, but in my experience, and I bet in most people's experience, it doesn't do much. And here is the reason why. The pH of the aquarium depends on several things, but one of the major contributors is the CO2 concentration of the room that the tank is in. And that's because CO2 is very soluble in water. And when it reacts with water, it forms carbonic acid, lowering the pH. So with that in mind, Drawing in outside air through a thin skimmer input tube does nothing to remove the CO2 from the room, especially if you're just letting the used skimmer air go back into the room. The easiest way to get rid of the CO2 is to open some windows because it allows for the exchange of CO2 rich indoor air for fresh outdoor air. Number 8. You shouldn't chase numbers. There is definitely truth to this, but at the same time, any saying that gives people an excuse to be lazy might be misconstrued as a rule, and that's why I chose to include this topic. In my opinion, you should be aiming for values, but at the same time, you shouldn't be overreacting when they are off. For example, I like my elk at 8, but if I check my elk and it's at 6, you bet I'm going to get it back up to 8. But I'm going to do it really slowly over the course of a couple of weeks. And I'll do that by simply overdosing elk every day by a little bit until it's back where I want it. Similarly, I don't get all worked up about using a salt with high elk. I like Red Sea Coral Pro and the fact that it has really high elk doesn't stop me from using it. So I like to aim for certain numbers but I don't freak out when it's off and I make adjustments slowly. But with all that being said, it's important to keep in mind that keeping things stable will improve colors and growth. Well alright guys, that's my version of reefing misconceptions. Let me know what you would add to this list or let me know what you don't agree with. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.